Good afternoon. As we have noted in recent days and recent hours, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is beginning. Hours after Russia recognized the so-called Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics as quote unquote independent, President Putin authorized Russian troops to enter those regions. He has taken other steps that amount to a direct assault on Ukraine's sovereignty. We responded in turn quickly and decisively. Within less than a day, we'd announced the first tranche of sanctions with our allies and partners, including those in the European Union, the United Kingdom, Canada, Japan, and Australia. Our German allies yesterday took resolute action to ensure that the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, what had been a prized $11 billion investment on the part of the Russian Federation, is suspended indefinitely. And as you have just seen, President Biden today authorized sanctions on Nord Stream 2 AG uh, and its corporate office holders. We have now taken complementary action using our own authorities uh, to ensure that Nord Stream 2 is off the table, just as we said it would be. In lockstep with our allies, we are blocking from the global financial system two large banks that are connected to the Kremlin and Russian military, and Ru Russian sovereign wealth can no longer trade on US or European financial markets. As you all know, we additionally sanctioned Russian elites, those elites who are, in many ways, complicit. This is the beginning of our response. If Putin escalates further, we will escalate further using additional sanctions and export controls, which we've yet to unveil, but are fully prepared to implement with allies and partners across the globe. The sequence of events that Secretary Blinken laid out at the UN Security Council last week appears to be proceeding exactly as he laid out. We've seen false flags. We've seen provocations. We've seen theatrically staged meetings at the Kremlin. We've seen cyber operations. And the list goes on. So where do we go from here? Moscow needs to demonstrate that it's serious about diplomacy. Russia's actions over the last 48 hours have, in fact, demonstrated the opposite. If Moscow's approach changes, we remain ready to engage. The United States and our allies and partners remain open to diplomacy. We are <clears throat> eager to engage to avert what would be a brutal and costly conflict. But as we have said, diplomacy cannot succeed unless Russia changes course. As we have said, we are prepared. We are prepared for any contingency going forward. Matt. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I have a question about the uh, Houthi sanctions, but it's largely semantic, so I'll leave it till later. Um, on uh, Nord Stream 2, you guys have been saying for months, indeed for over a year since the waivers were, were first granted, that in fact this gave you additional leverage withholding the sanctions did, and it would serve as a deterrent. Clearly, it didn't, uh, you, they didn't provide you with any leverage at all that we can tell because of what you just said in your opening statement about the invasion beginning. So, you know, how, how do you explain to people why you didn't impose these, these sanctions earlier? So, Matt, it's important, uh, and let's just rewind the tape uh, and remember what has happened in recent hours. Uh, yesterday, within... Uh, a short time frame of the Russian invasion beginning, Germany took decisive, resolute action to take Nord Stream 2 off the table. Today, we followed with our own complementary authorities uh, using uh, uh, the, the uh, powers and, and capabilities uh, that we have. We have always said, in the context of Nord Stream 2, in the context uh, of the steps that we are taking with partners and allies around the world, uh, that one of the most important tools we have in our arsenal is transatlantic unity. Uh, the fact that Germany acted so quickly, so decisively, uh, is in many ways a product of the coordination of the consultation uh, we have done now with two successive German governments. Uh, of course, it started with Chancellor Merkel and her government. Uh, and in more recent months, we have had concerted discussions uh, with Chancellor Schultz uh, and his government. The fact that we are acting in unison immediately to take these steps that 
essentially remove Nord Stream 2 from the equation, uh, that is a byproduct, that is uh, a result of the work that we have done together uh, with the German government over the course of these last uh, several months, over the course of the last year or so. So it sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that your argument, that your argument is that if you had imposed the sanctions earlier, the Germans wouldn't have suspended, done what, that the Germans wouldn't have done what they did yesterday, or it would have been a much bigger lift to get them to, to get them to do that. I, we, what we have said, and our, what our strategy has been predicated on the knowledge uh, that transatlantic unity is the most uh, powerful yeah. instrument we have. But, uh, I, I don't, but, but look, the pipeline's already been built, okay? Now, whether it gets turned on or not I, is, is, well, another, is, but, is, is, is another question. Right. So, so you, but you, presumably you, you had more leverage, and I, and I don't understand why you don't think that you would have had more leverage if it hadn't been, if these sanctions had been imposed before the pipeline was finished. So, Matt, you also raise a good point. Uh, the pipeline, when this administration came into office, was more than 90% complete. Uh, we have imposed sanctions under PISA. Uh, on uh, a number of uh, targets associated uh, with this pipeline, persons and entities. Uh, but the fact is that had we sanctioned uh, Nord Stream 2 AG, had we sanctioned its corporate office holders, uh, it is far from clear that that would have kept the pipeline from going into operation. What the Germans did yesterday uh, was to ensure that the pipeline is no longer part of the equation. So by acting together with the Germans, how we did, when we did, and the way in which we did, uh, we have ensured uh, that this is an $11 billion prize investment that is now a hunk of steel uh, sitting at the bottom of the sea. All right, well, I, I don't think you though can prove, uh, and, and the, the converse can't be proven either, but you, do, just, you just don't know if imposing the sanctions earlier would have had more of a deterrent effect or any deterrent. Well, effect, if, since, if, since, if, if we would have made it a sunk cost many, many months ago for the Russian Federation, I don't think that would have had much deterrent capability. Well, but it hasn't anyway, so I'll leave it there. Uh, Simon. Um, yeah, the Secretary um, obviously said yesterday he had cancelled his meeting with, with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, um, but you guys remain open to diplomacy. So what exactly would you want to see from Russia in order to, you know, reschedule that meeting in order to resume uh, some kind of d diplomacy, uh, you know, diplomatic talks between you. And um, just an additional one, um, you've, you've sort of, this is the last, of, or this is part of the first tranche of, of sanctions, the, the Nord Stream 2 sanctions that just came out. Uh, is that the end of the first tranche or is there uh, more coming in that? And can you say uh, whether more sanctions actions will be taken if Russia uh, you know, doesn't escalate further from where it is now? Well, the question you ask is w what we would like to see. Let me tell you, let me start by answering that question by um, letting you know what we no longer will engage in, uh, and that is the pretense of diplomacy. Uh, you heard the secretary use that phrase yesterday, and that is what we have seen. Uh, this is and has been, in some ways, diplomatic kabuki theater uh, on the part of uh, the Russians making statements that they are committed to a diplomatic path while their actions uh, suggest exactly the opposite. Uh, that is not an environment in which diplomacy can achieve the results uh, that it needs to achieve. Uh, our goal here, even as the Russian invasion of Ukraine is beginning, is to avert the worst case scenario, the worst case scenario that uh, we have warned about for some time now, uh, and we have gone into great detail in terms of what that could look like. Uh, electronic warfare, uh, the, uh, uh, in a, a fuller scale uh, invasion, uh, uh, an attack on major urban centers, including Kyiv, a city of 2.9 million people, uh, horrific uh, human rights abuses, atrocities, potential war crimes. Uh, these are all things uh, that even as the invasion is beginning, uh, we are going to do everything that we reasonably can uh, to prevent from happening. And so that's why, uh, together with our uh, allies and partners, we absolutely remain open to diplomacy, but only if Moscow is serious. We are not going to engage uh, in this pretense with them, uh, during which 
they draw out the process, suggest one thing, do another, uh, ready uh, their preparations, move their forces closer to the border, develop and refine their plans uh, as they give the world a head fake uh, that they are actually committed to the diplomatic path. Now, there are a number of ways that Moscow could indicate that it is serious. It essentially boils down uh, to de-escalation. That would be uh, the most concrete, uh, the clearest indication that diplomacy has the potential to bear fruit, that diplomacy has the potential to save lives. Uh, that is the kind of diplomacy we are interested in. Uh, that is also not the kind of diplomacy uh, that we have seen any indication as of yet uh, that Moscow is interested in. Vivian. Jeff, can you comment on the reports that uh, the U.S. informed the Ukrainian government that an attack could happen as soon as tonight and that um, Kharkiv is, is possibly, um, you know, in the line of attack, that it could be directly, um, you know, that the Russian troops could roll over the border and attack Kharkiv tonight. What I'll say about those reports is they are entirely consistent with what we have been saying for some time now, uh, that Russia has amassed forces along Ukraine's borders in Belarus, uh, positioned the assets, the heavy weaponry, uh, the soldiers, the service members it would need to undertake uh, an invasion of Ukraine uh, at a moment's notice. That has been true for some time now. Uh, so for several days now, uh, we have said the invasion is potentially imminent, meaning it could start today, it could start tomorrow, uh, it could start next week. What we haven't seen, is, and this goes back to Simon's question, is any indication that the Russians are backing away from this. We have not seen any data points that alleviate the grave concern, the profound concern that we've been expressing for some time yet, uh, some time now. Uh, so the invasion remains potentially imminent, uh, and Moscow is poised uh, to do precisely the kinds of things that uh, you just uh, outlined. Can I just follow up really quickly also on something Simon said uh, that you and Simon discussed? You know, with this notion of diplomacy still on the table, and now you're saying that it's possible that, uh, you know, Donbass is obviously being attacked, if not uh, actually, then rhetorically, that the Russians are now, um, you know, uh, uh, acknowledging or recognizing their autonomy and sovereignty. So how, how can you then justify discussions about diplomacy when this is underway? I mean, you keep on saying that the Russians have to show that they're serious, they have to de-escalate, but could they pause things right now and possibly engage in talks with the U.S., or do significant sort of scale back have to happen? Do we have to see troops falling back before that's discussed? Is Donbass being regarded differently from the rest of the country? So you heard from uh, our colleagues at the White House and, and others here over the course of the day yesterday, including the Secretary, that the invasion is beginning. Uh, and when we uh, spoke about the beginning of the invasion, we talked about several developments over the course of uh, the 20, that 24-hour period. Uh, Vladimir Putin's recognition uh, of the so-called uh, DNR and LNR, uh, uh, the order that he conveyed to the Ministry of Defense uh, to deploy forces into the Donbass, uh, the authorization uh, that he sought to send Russian service members uh, into service extraterritorially, uh, the rhetorical assault, essentially, that we saw uh, President Putin deliver uh, against Ukraine, denying Ukraine uh, its sovereignty and, and essentially uh, its right to exist. Those are what we've seen. Those are what we've heard. Uh, but as I just mentioned, uh, there are some things, many things, in fact, uh, that Russia is poised to do at a moment's notice uh, that we have not yet seen. A large-scale invasion, an assault on urban centers, uh, the human rights abuses, the potential war crimes, the atrocities. Uh, that uh, we have great concern uh, could take place. Uh, these are all things that we want to prevent. So you asked the question, uh, why would we engage in diplomacy? Well, we would engage in diplomacy to save lives. We would engage in diplomacy to prevent an all-out war. Uh, this is a war that would be brutal. It would be costly. It would be, in many ways, devastating uh, for the Russian Federation, of course, for the Ukrainian people. And the way in which the Russian Federation would wage this war, you heard from the National Security Advisor, it would not be uh, a uh, type of conflict 
that you might ima imagine over territory uh, or over concrete ends. Uh, you heard the National Security Advisor make the case that this would be a war waged against the Ukrainian people uh, to subjugate them, to crush them, uh, to exact, in many ways, uh, revenge. Uh, this is what we want to prevent. Uh, so we are ready to engage, uh, but we need a partner. We need a negotiating uh, uh, counterpart that demonstrates seriousness of purpose. We have not seen that from the Russian Federation. In fact, uh, we have seen the opposite at every turn. Andrea. Um, do you have diplomats right now in Lviv, uh, or w are they spending the nights in Poland and going back and forth? Have we made any kind of commitment to the safe passage to any kind of extraction, if you will, for key members of the Zelensky government, if necessary? And what would be our commitment to any insurgency that developed, given if it were a full-scale invasion, if, if any? I mean, there was training, there was support. And one final question. should write these down. Sorry. Uh, your reaction to uh, former Secretary of State Pompeo and former President Trump praising Putin's cleverness, uh, strength, and smartness in the last couple I'll of I'll start days. with that one. Uh, I have no response. In fact, I have no words. Uh, to move on to Lviv, uh, I think what uh, you heard from us uh, on Sunday is that uh, the Secretary had uh, determined uh, that it was in the best interest, in the best uh, interest of the safety and security uh, of our team on the ground uh, for them to temporarily relocate uh, into Poland. Uh, they have been spending the night uh, in Poland, but they have been regularly uh, essentially commuting back into Lviv. Our uh, charge, uh, Christina Kavin, uh, has been uh, leading the team back on the ground in Lviv. We have every expectation that, we, that they will continue to do so as long as the security environment remains permissive. Uh, when they are on the ground in Lviv, they're able to undertake uh, emergency consular services uh, to help uh, Americans who may be seeking to leave the country. Uh, they are engaging with our uh, Ukrainian partners, uh, and they have important missions that they're able to fulfill uh, in Lviv. But regardless of whether they're in Lviv, whether they are in Poland, uh, that in no way changes uh, the commitment we have uh, to our Ukrainian partners. It in no way diminishes the partnership uh, we have with uh, Kyiv. We've remained in constant contact uh, with our partners in the Ukrainian government. And that takes me to your question about uh, any advice uh, we may have passed on to the Zelensky government. Uh, the fact is that we are in contact uh, with our uh, friends and counterparts in Kyiv on a daily basis. As you know, Foreign Minister Kuleba uh, was here yesterday. The president had an opportunity to uh, speak to President Zelensky uh, over the weekend. The secretary was uh, in the Oval Office uh, for uh, that call. Uh, the president, President Zelensky and his team, know that they have the steadfast and unwavering support uh, of the United States. Of course, our goal in all of this is to avert that worst case scenario, the worst case scenario that uh, we've already talked about in the course of this briefing. Uh, the fact is that the president and his team uh, will make decisions in the coming days best uh, based on the best interests of, of their country and their people. Uh, the foreign minister was asked a question about this uh, just yesterday. Uh, he provided uh, uh, an insight into uh, their thinking, but these will be decisions uh, that uh, our Ukrainian counterparts will make um, uh, based on uh, their own determinations and, and their own calculus. Uh, in terms of our, um, uh, let me put it this way, in terms of uh, our continued assistance uh, to our Ukrainian partners, uh, the president has made very clear that uh, in the event of a Russian invasion, which, as we have said, is beginning, we will not only continue our defensive security assistance to our Ukrainian partners, but we will double down on it. Uh, so on top of the unprecedented level of defensive security assistance that we provided to our Ukrainian partners over uh, the last year, $650 million, including a $200 million uh, drawdown that the President signed in December, uh, deliveries of which uh, continue to uh, flow into Kyiv, 
uh, flow into Ukraine, I should say. Uh, we will continue, uh, not only continue to provide that support, uh, but we will uh, look to uh, further uh, that defensive security assistance for uh, our Ukrainian partners. Uh, Kyla. Um, I'm just wondering if Russia has responded at all to Blinken's yet letter yesterday and um, if, you know, what diplomatic conversations between the U.S. and Russia have looked like in the last 24 hours? What I'll say is uh, we, the Secretary laid out uh, for Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, in a, a private communication uh, the fact that under the current circumstances uh, and um, what we have seen from the Russian, Russian Federation so far, uh, our conclusion that a meeting this week in Geneva uh, would not serve the purpose uh, that any such meeting uh, would need to serve. And first and foremost, that is to avert a brutal, massive, costly conflict. Uh, the, the Russians and all of you and, uh, later heard that publicly uh, from Secretary Blinken. Uh, the Russians know um, precisely our position. They know through private communications and through our own public messaging uh, that we stand ready to engage diplomatically uh, if they are willing to do so uh, in good faith. Uh, and if they are uh, willing to uh, change their posture, uh, we will be uh, ready uh, willing and able uh, to engage them on this. And, and did the Secretary detail what in good faith would look like in this letter, or was it uh, broad descriptions like you just gave? We, we are not going to be uh, prescriptive uh, in terms of uh, what de-escalation might look like, uh, what good faith might look like. Uh, the, we have been very clear, uh, because all of you know, presumably uh, our counterparts in the Russian Federation know, uh, what steps might look like uh, if they were interested in signaling de-escalation. Uh, we have not seen any of those steps. And again, uh, we have seen steps that actually move in the opposite direction. And then just last question. Um, can or will the U.S. keep open our embassy in Moscow uh, if there's a full-scale invasion into Ukraine? We believe uh, in times of conflict, in times of crisis, uh, that the ability to communicate uh, is in some ways even more imperative. Uh, now, long before uh, the massive Russian military buildup started along Ukraine's borders uh, in Belarus, of course, uh, our team on the ground uh, in Moscow and throughout Russia, uh, they were in a very difficult operating environment, a very difficult operating environment because of the restrictions uh, that the Russian Federation had uh, imposed on them. Uh, it will be our goal uh, to uh, be in a position to maintain uh, diplomatic communication, the ability uh, to convey clearly uh, any messages that uh, we need to send to uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, embassies are an important tool uh, in that, uh, but we have also seen uh, the Russian Federation, even in recent days, uh, escalate on an unprovoked and needless basis. Uh, the um, bilateral uh, challenges in terms of our own uh, diplomatic staffing uh, in Moscow um, and our ability uh, to operate uh, an embassy on the ground. But again, uh, we believe communication, we believe the ability to pass messages uh, is even more important in times of, uh, of great crisis. Ned, Ned, on Nord Street, uh, are you working with the Germans to find alternative sources of energy for them? I mean, you know, it seems like the, the pipeline is not going to go full you know, or are going to go operational anytime soon. So are you working with them, with the Qataris or any other potential suppliers perhaps in Algeria and so on, and about the means to get it there? Now, so, a quick question on the diplomacy. Sure. Uh, let me start with your uh, question on the energy. And of course, uh, this was something that President Biden discussed uh, yesterday. Uh, we have been, uh, Frank, we've been candid uh, with the American people uh, that our measures, the measures we uh, have and are prepared to impose on the Russian Federation uh, certainly won't be cost-free for the Russian Federation, but uh, they won't be entirely cost-free uh, for the rest of the world uh, as well. And so that is why uh, we are working with countries uh, around the world, uh, executing a plan with major producer, pr producing and consuming countries uh, to secure the stability uh, of global energy supplies, whether that's oil, whether that's uh, LNG. Uh, for energy consumers, and you heard this uh, from uh, Deputy National Security Advisor uh, Dilip Singh uh, yesterday, um, he made the point that we all have strategic reserves at our disposal. 
uh, and those reserves, we know, uh, could support the supply uh, of global energy. Uh, the White House announced uh, such a move uh, late last year. Uh, there are other countries uh, that have their own uh, strategic supplies. For um, energy producers, we know that many of them have spare capacity uh, to provide uh, supply to global markets that could uh, balance those markets in the event uh, of any supply disruption. Uh, more broadly, we've been very clear with the Russian Federation uh, that any further attempt uh, to weaponize energy, to constrict flows with malign geopolitical uh, intent or purpose uh, would have massive consequences. And to your point, uh, would only further uh, the longstanding effort to diversify uh, energy uh, supplies for Europe and uh, the rest of the world. Uh, we have heard from a number of countries, uh, including Japan, including Australia, including Slovakia, uh, that uh, they are taking uh, concrete steps uh, in terms of uh, global energy markets. We expect other countries uh, will have announcements of their own. Uh, we also know that the International Energy Agency uh, has announced that it's monitoring uh, and consulting with uh, member states to ensure um, uh, market stability going forward. But to the question about diversification of supply, this has been uh, a longstanding uh, goal of ours. And uh, to go back to the question of Nord Stream 2, uh, there was uh, the communique that together we uh, drafted and finalized uh, with the German government over uh, the summer, in the summer of uh, July of 2021. Uh, it laid out a series of steps uh, that Germany committed to taking with Ukraine uh, to help Ukraine diversify uh, its supply of energy, cognizant uh, that Russia had weaponized energy flows in the past, uh, and Russia uh, might have been looking to do so again in the future. Uh, if Russia were to take that step, we've been very clear uh, about the massive consequences that would befall it. Uh, and your response to armed diplomacy. So are you urging the Ukrainians not to cut off relations with Russia? And because there was, there was talk that they might cut off all diplomatic relations with Russia. That, that's a decision for the Ukrainian government to right. make. Of, of course, but uh, are you bringing that in the, I mean, if they decided to cut off their relations with Russia, you wouldn't say, no, don't do it now, or go ahead, do it, whatever. Uh, that is a decision for the Ukrainian government to make. Uh, again, the Russian Federation has uh, launched uh, an assault on uh, Ukraine's sovereignty, on its territorial integrity, uh, in many different ways, in many different forms. But uh, the uh, decision as to whether to continue diplomatic relations between Kyiv and, and Moscow, that's something that Kyiv will have to have to decide. I'm curious about your reference <clears throat> publicly from the podium to uh, what the Russians have been doing as Kabuki theater. Um, what are specifically are you referring to? The meeting in Geneva between Secretary Blinken and, and, and Foreign Minister Lavrov, the UN Security Council meeting uh, last week, or even yesterday, whatever it was, a day or two ago, the Russian National Security Council. Uh, so I think you could point to any number of steps. The the uh, what comes to my mind immediately uh, was the dramatic theatrical scene we saw. I guess it was last week now between President Putin. Uh, and, uh, and his deputies, uh, in which they had a, what was scripted, I assume, to be a pretty candid exchange, indicating uh, that uh, the Russian Federation should pursue diplomacy, uh, only as, at that very moment and in the days that followed, uh, we saw additional Russian forces right. go to the border, we saw additional Russian forces uh, take up readiness. Uh, that is not consistent with a country that purports uh, to be interested in diplomacy. No, but that is not diplomacy per se. That was an internal government meeting, whether they was staged. That, that was Kabuki you know. Theater. I think well, we can agree. Uh, fine. Yeah. But I want to know if you're talking about the meeting in Geneva between the secretary and Foreign I was referring to the referring incident of Kabuki Theater that I just mentioned okay, to you. Okay. Because I, I just want to make sure that you don't think you're, you're not now in a position where you think that the meeting in Geneva that did happen was a waste of time and simply a, an entertainment. Look, I, I wouldn't want to characterize uh, the, the Security Council meetings are a waste of time because the, I, well, I just want to make sure I, that you're not so talking about the UN those. Security Council meeting most certainly was not a waste of time because the Russian Federation and the entire world heard uh, from uh, a number of countries uh, the uh, broad uh, and strong consensus uh, that this should be resolved uh, diplomatically uh, and that state sovereignty should be an inviolable principle. Uh, that certainly uh, was uh, not pointless. Yes. Sure. Security Council meeting, 
um, U.S. officials said that they believed Russia could be using it as a pretext for this invasion. And you you said earlier that this is and has been in some ways Kabuki theater all along. So are, are you, to Matt's point, are you making the assessment that they the security need... The Russian Security Council meeting you're referring to? No, sorry, the one, the one last Thursday before there was a briefing where U.S. officials said they believed, um, given the document that the Russian mission circulated, that they were going to use the meeting as a pretext. So are, are, do you assess now that all of these diplomatic engagements were, were part of a charade to give Russia cover, to, to show that they had been you know, engaging in good faith diplomacy in their mind? I, I, I wouldn't want to make a sweeping categorical judgment like that. Uh, what I will say is that if you take a step back, uh, we have not seen any, indi any indication uh, that Russia's stated commitment to the diplomatic path uh, had bore any resemblance uh, to uh, its actions uh, or that its actions uh, reflected uh, any commitment to, stated commitment to uh, the diplomatic path. Uh, that is not to say that there is not value uh, in these sessions. And I think the UN Security Council session that uh, you all saw last Thursday was extraordinarily valuable. Uh, it was valuable for uh, even for the Russian Federation. Uh, and if any of those messages got to the Russian people, uh, they would have heard uh, a strong message uh, of resolve uh, and consensus and unanimity uh, from the rest of the world uh, that the steps uh, that Putin was taking, uh, the plans that he may well still uh, have in mind, uh, that is not something that uh, the rest of the world is prepared to countenance. But the meetings in Geneva, the, the um, non-papers back and forth, that you don't think that that all was a charade by the Russian government? I, I am not prepared to uh, use such wholesale language. Now, have we been able to uh, deter and to uh, prevent uh, the worst case scenario? Uh, that's still an unresolved question. Uh, what is not unresolved is that we have seen continued signs that the Russian Federation is moving forward. Uh, with the plans that we have been warning about uh, for for weeks. Can I just point out a follow-up? Uh, especially the Japanese, you know, who That's invented it. You know, no, no. They, they pay to go see it. So no, see no it. offense intended. Yes. Can I yes. just yes. another yeah. follow-up? Uh, yesterday, Foreign Minister Kuleba said that their plan A, obviously, is to use diplomacy to deter Russia. Mm -hmm. Plan B is to defend every inch of Ukrainian territory. You have previously praised their restraint. Uh, do you agree with their, their plan B? Do you think they have a right to self-defense? And if Russia moves past the current uh, areas that the separatists control in the Donbas, do the Ukrainians have a right to respond? Of course the Ukrainians have a right to self-defense. Yes? in terms of its stance on the, the, the Ukraine situation. At times they've talked about the importance of state sovereignty, at other times they've uh, you know, railed against NATO expansion. Have you, has, has the State Department been in communication with PRC interlocutors seeking clarity on their position? Um, and have you laid out any ways in which uh, you know, these ongoing signals might undercut US-China uh, ties? And on, on a related note, you've, you've kind of hinted before that if the PRC were to seek to uh, undermine the impact of U.S. sanctions on Russia, then the U.S. would have countermeasures. Have those discussions continued with PRC interlocutors? Well, as you know, uh, Secretary Blinken had an opportunity to uh, speak to his counterpart, Foreign Minister Wong, uh, just the other night. Uh, and one of the two primary topics they discussed uh, was uh, Russia's, uh, the crisis uh, that Russia has uh, needlessly precipitated uh, with Ukraine and with, with the rest of the world. Uh, Secretary Blinken, and we issued a re readout, uh, the PRC uh, also issued their own uh, readout, uh, but you saw in our readout that the Secretary made very clear uh, where we stand uh, in terms of our unwavering support for Ukraine's territorial, uh, territorial integrity and its, its sovereignty. Uh, and I think, especially that last point, sovereignty uh, should be an element that the PRC uh, understands quite well. We often, uh, in statecraft, statecraft, here the PRC cite this principle of sovereignty, which in any number of instances uh, they have claimed uh, should be inviolable, should be uh, sacrosanct, should be one of the found foundational rules uh, that countries abide by and respect. Uh, so you'll have to ask the PRC how they 
marry uh, that longstanding position um, with anything less than uh, an effort to use the considerable influence and sway uh, they have with the Russian Federation to urge Vladimir Putin to back down, to de-escalate. Uh, whether they are doing that, uh, you'll have to ask them. Um, but we did see uh, in the readout uh, that our PRC counterparts are also calling for the situation to be resolved diplomatically and to be resolved uh, peacefully. Now, whether uh, Putin heeds uh, that call, I think that is, uh, that is not something we yet know. Uh, what about relaying the potential impact on US-China relations? Look, um, in, in, terms of, in terms of our bilateral relationship with- In terms of China, China's support for Russia and its railing against NATO expansion and the potential uh, you know, tacit endorsement that that provides, what's the impact of that on US-China relations? Well, uh, we believe, and we've, we've made this point not only about the PRC, um, but uh, every responsible country in the world has, in our estimation, an obligation uh, to use any influence it has with the Russian Federation uh, to urge, to incentivize, uh, to advocate for uh, Vladimir Putin uh, to back down for the Russian Federation uh, to de-escalate. Again, you will have to ask the PRC uh, whether they have used their own considerable influence uh, with the Russian Federation to that end. Of course, we've all read uh, the 5,000 word uh, joint communique, and we can um, glean our own conclusions uh, from that. I think what gives us concern uh, is that from that manifesto and from what we've seen, uh, not only in recent uh, days, weeks, and months, but in, in recent years, uh, is this growing partnership between Russia uh, and the PRC. And I say it's concerning because we talk about a rules-based international order, uh, a rules-based international order that has been at the crux of seven plus decades of unprecedented levels of stability, of security, of prosperity uh, the world over, whether that's in uh, Europe um, or the Indo-Pacific and, and places in between. Uh, it is true, I think, we think, that Russia and the PRC uh, also want uh, a world order. Uh, this is a vision that they appear to be developing together, if you read that uh, communique. But this is an order uh, that is and would be profoundly illiberal, uh, an order that uh, stands in contrast uh, to the system that uh, countries around the world, including, by the way, uh, Russia uh, and, in some ways, the PRC, uh, have built over the last seven decades. It is an order that uh, is in many ways destructive uh, rather than additive. Uh, so that is uh, as we see this relationship develop uh, and we've seen uh, something that gives us great concern. Uh, and of course in, in recent days we've seen uh, Russia reach out to its autocratic counterparts uh, in other uh, corners of the globe. This gets back to one of the core points that uh, the president has been making since uh, before he assumed high office, uh, and that is increasingly we are seeing the world divided between democracy and autocracy. Uh, it is and has been a charge of this president and this administration's foreign policy uh, to um, act to unite uh, our democratic colleagues uh, around the world, uh, to act in unison, to galvanize um, uh, collective action. Uh, and I think whether the challenge has been what Russia uh, is doing, whether the challenge has been what uh, the PRC uh, is doing, uh, what we are seeing from uh, state and non-state actors around the world, uh, you've seen us uh, succeed in that. Uh, but it will continue to be an animating principle as we continue to see uh, the forces of autocracy uh, the force, forces of authoritarianism, the forces of illiberalism uh, continue uh, to work together and attempt uh, to combine forces. But the other, the other point, even as they try to do that, uh, we are confident, we are confident in 
our own abilities. We are confident in our abilities as uh, an international community. And whether that's the West, whether that's a community of democracies, uh, whether it is our system of uh, alliances and partnerships uh, that span the globe. Uh, and we're confident uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, if you look at it quantitatively, uh, we have 50% plus of global GDP. Uh, we have a large share uh, of the world's population. China and Russia, in terms of their GDP, are what, 20% of global GDP? Uh, we have innovation, we have entrepreneurship, uh, we have a shared set uh, of values that we really think are uh, a core instrument uh, of, national, uh, of national power. Uh, and we know that when we put all of this together, uh, especially when we act with our allies and our partners, as we've done uh, in the face of the challenge that Russia has posed, uh, in the face of the challenge to the uh, rules-based international system that the PRC has posed, uh, or even when you talk about uh, the threats and challenges uh, that we face that are not uh, state actors, climate change, COVID, uh, economic recovery. Uh, we know that acting together, uh, we are situated to take on any threat, to seize uh, any opportunity. And that's really been the driving force uh, of our foreign policy. It's, it's why uh, Secretary Blinken spent so much time of his first year in office uh, repairing, revitalizing, in some ways uh, reimagining uh, the system of alliances and partnerships. Uh, and you are seeing the dividends of that uh, now play out, even in recent hours. Well, well, first of all, can you guess how long that answer was? I, how many I, minutes I, that was? <laughs> I, I, I'm sure, I, I'm sure you will tell up. me. I, well, I, I can't because my, my, my otter seems to have like frozen here. Um, I but hope if, you, I hope you pay it, for the premium but version. If you're, but, but, so. if you're, <laughs> but, but if you're boasting about how reinventing it and you're seeing the, fr the, 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 the fruits of, of all that labor now, you're talking about the the, the United the United, the United response of the international to, community. To Russia. Okay. Yeah. Can I uh, purely? Uh, it's unrelated to Ukraine, but it is China, uh, and that is something that I know Nike is interested in and has been asking about uh, before. But you know, there is barely an anniversary, the, a diplomatic an anniversary in diplomatic history that goes by without the U.S. the State Department, at least, if not the White House, making some kind of comment about it. And in that light, regardless of how tense or strained relations are now with China, wh why is it that there hasn't been any mention of Nixon's, uh, pre former President Nixon's, the 50th anniversary of former President Nixon's visit to China, which was, you know, a pretty groundbreaking event when it happened, paved the way for recognition, of U.S. recognition of the PRC and di opening of diplomatic relations. And it seems to me that it would make sense for there to be some kind of mention of this, or are you just like embarrassed by it now and think that it should never have happened? Uh, I, I, I don't think, I, <laughs> certainly not the latter. Um, I, I, Matt, there are some anniversaries that, that we commemorate. There are, there are other anniversaries uh, that uh, we don't. I, I'm not aware of any um, plans yeah, at the moment I for a statement, but. About, you know, like the 17th anniversary of, you know, U.S. Iceland relations or something, not to demean Iceland, but I mean, you know, these kinds of things get attention and and this one which was you know a pretty big deal a bfd as the president might say at the time and and since just seems to be being ignored i i don't know that we're ignoring it i i'm not sure that i would uh, equate uh, not putting out a formal statement with uh, with ignoring it uh nike thank you for asking uh, one more on pakistan can i ask about Pakistan Prime Minister Khan's visit to Russia. Mm -hmm. Does the State Department have a, a, an assessment of his visit at this timing? Uh, well, we're certainly aware uh, of the trip uh, and the, the points uh, I made earlier uh, about uh, the PRC in some ways uh, apply here. We believe it's a responsibility uh, of every responsible country uh, around the world uh, to voice uh, concern, uh, to voice uh, objection uh, to what uh, Putin uh, appears to have in mind for uh, Ukraine. Uh, we've communicated to Pakistan uh, our position regarding uh, Russia's uh, further renewed invasion of Ukraine, uh, and uh, we have briefed them on our efforts to pursue diplomacy uh, over war. 
uh, we have a, um, uh, a long-standing uh, uh, partnership uh, and cooperation with Pakistan. Uh, we view our partnership uh, with uh, a prosperous, with a democratic Pakistan uh, as critical to uh, U.S. interests. And uh, we certainly hope when it comes to those uh, shared interests, uh, the aversion of a costly conflict, uh, the aversion of a destabilizing conflict, uh, that every country around the world uh, would make that point clearly uh, in unambiguous language uh, in their engagements with the Russian Federation. Andrea. On the time, uh, can I, sorry, can I just follow up on Khan's visit? On the timing of his visit, is it to the U.S. read that he's indirectly endorsing Putin? You would have to ask uh, the Pakistani government what the intent is. I'm asking your read. You would have to ask the, ask the Pakistani government. Uh, I'm just not in a position to offer an assessment on uh, the timing of uh, a foreign counterpart's travel to another country. Yes, Andrea. If it's an assessment of Vladimir Putin than the one that this government had, that this president had after Geneva, or was the uh, previous assessment wrong? Uh, the, the previous assessment uh, and the uh, assessment now is that we would prefer a relationship with Russia that is stable and predictable. Uh, but at every turn before Geneva, or just about every turn before Geneva, uh, and at turns since Geneva, uh, the Russian Federation has indicated that uh, they have apparently little interest uh, in that type of relationship. So we've always said uh, that, and we said this before Geneva, uh, when we responded uh, decisively in response to uh, interference in our elections, in response to the Russian Federation's use of uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, against uh, dissidents on uh, foreign soil uh, for solar winds, uh, that we would respond uh, decisively, strongly, uh, in, in response uh, to these types of activities. We have. The same is true uh, if Russia continues its invasion of Ukraine. Same principle applies. Uh, separate question on a different subject, if I could ask a quick question about Iran. OK. Um, any final questions on Russia, Ukraine, before we move on? Yes, OK. Yes, please, no, please. Uh, on sanctions. Yes. Uh, uh, today, the Russian ambassador uh, to Washington said that uh, he doesn't remember a single uh, day that uh, when he, the, uh, Russia lived without restrictions from the Western world. Putin proved he's immune to sanctions. He has uh, $600 billion uh, in Federal Reserve. He has been in the driving seat making decisions to which the West is responding now and uh, was responding since 2008. Are you thinking of a strategical approach to deal with this? You just said that they are trying to change the world order. I, so to the statement from the Russian Federation that they have been under sanctions since 2014, uh, that is, uh, of course, accurate. Uh, the sanctions that uh, we have put in place and that we will continue to put in place uh, are qualitatively different uh, from any measures uh, that the United States or any other country has imposed on the Russian Federation, including uh, in 2014. So if they are comparing what they've been under now to uh, what they will be under in, in uh, going forward, uh, if this invasion moves forward, uh, that would be a profound miscalculation uh, on their part. When you talk about and think about uh, the sanctions that we've already put in place, um, Nord Stream 2 is off the table. The Germans have taken decisive action. We have taken uh, decisive action. That's uh, an $11 billion uh, project that is now uh, a piece of steel uh, at the bottom uh, of the ocean. Uh, we have, uh, in, in lockstep with our allies, put in place um, blocking sanctions uh, against the fifth largest Russian financial institution. That's $50 billion uh, in assets. Uh, we've put in place blocking sanctions against uh, another bank that uh, funds the Ministry of Defense with some $35 billion uh, in assets. Uh, in other words, these institutions can no longer make any transactions with the United States or with Europe, given Europe's, the EU's own uh, corresponding uh, actions in this regard. Um, here's the other point. With the authorities we have, with the intent we have, no Russian financial institution is safe uh, if the invasion proceeds. Uh, as you heard from Dalip Singh yesterday, we are ready uh, at the press of a button to take action against the two largest financial institutions in Russia. Uh, together, these are institutions that hold uh, three quarters of a trillion dollars in assets, $750 billion uh, in assets, half of the total 
uh, Russian banking system. Uh, there are other uh, measures and moves we uh, have in store and that are ready uh, if Russia continues with this invasion, including export controls, uh, targeted sanctions against oligarchs and elites, uh, and, and other measures. Um, so the Russians can uh, depict these moves however they would like. Uh, I think it is noteworthy uh, what we heard from our Ukrainian partners uh, yesterday. Uh, you heard from Foreign Minister Kuleba as he was standing right next to Secretary Blinken here at the department. He said that, quote, we do appreciate the sanctions which were announced today. Uh, they target Russia. They're very specific. Uh, they are painful. Uh, please. Uh, please, go ahead. Yeah, Joel. Uh, thanks, Ned. Um, I arrived with a couple questions of my own and have a couple follow-ups for yeah. this interesting conversation um, from what you told my colleagues. Uh, first, do you think that China, given their desire for the world order that you just described, uh, regards Russia's invasion of Ukraine as a step towards bringing that about? Uh, it is certainly not a step in the direction of the principle that the PRC um, uh, claims to prize. Uh, and that is state sovereignty. You, uh, I think everyone in this room is uh, familiar with the position the PRC has taken in response uh, to Russia's aggression in Ukraine uh, since 2014. Uh, I wouldn't want to characterize that, but uh, it suggests a level of deep unease. Uh, so uh, again, I would refer you to the PRC uh, for uh, any comment they might have on what Putin has in store. But uh, if we are to judge the PRC uh, based on uh, what they have said uh, consistently on the world stage in any number uh, of fora, uh, a direct assault on the sovereignty, on the territorial integrity uh, of another state, that would not be consistent with what we've heard. Yeah, I was just trying to clarify because I thought I heard you say they're, they've combined forces somehow. Um, uh, it, it was a reference to the to the burgeoning partnership that we've seen between these two countries over the course of many years now. Okay, on on Ukraine's Plan B, fighting for every inch, um, you know, Senator Reissue is, of course, ranking on foreign relations and on on intelligence, uh, or a senior member of the Intelligence Committee, has said that Russia could sweep across Ukraine pretty quickly. Their first day would be their, their best day. They'd immediately face resistance movements. Um, so I wonder, would the United States, as a, as a member of NATO, uh, either encourage or object to other NATO members offering this Ukrainian resistance uh, cross-border safe haven? Uh, countries are going to make their own sovereign decisions. Um, we have uh, in, in recent weeks, as you know, worked with a number of our NATO allies uh, to authorize them to provide U.S. origin equipment uh, to our Ukrainian partners. This is defensive security equipment uh, with uh, uh, an understanding uh, that our Ukrainian partners uh, need uh, supplies, need material uh, to defend themselves. The United States has provided them with this. Uh, we have um, a number of our NATO allies uh, have done the same. But uh, when it comes to decision that uh, NATO allies or other countries in Europe might make um, along those lines, I'd need to refer you there. Um, and that, you know, I, I guess I wonder, do you see any lessons from Afghanistan for the kind of risk that, that where, where, of course, when the Taliban could, could retire across the border to, to a place where they couldn't be attacked, uh, then that was difficult for a modern military to defeat? I, look, I would hesitate to, to make battlefield comparisons between two very different countries. Um, finally, what I hope are truly a couple quick ones, those Nord Stream 2 sanctions, are those permanent, or do you think that, like, like you know, the, the, the permanent punishment for this is that that's gone, or do you regard that as something that could be lifted again later in exchange for de-escalation? And could we also get uh, an answer to uh, Foreign Minister Kaleva's request for a Lend-Lease program? Do you expect that to proceed? Uh, look, uh, the fact is that sanctions are a means to an end. Uh, there is no sanction in any responsible sanctions program around the world uh, that is permanent. Uh, and that is precisely because we don't sanction countries uh, just with the goal of enacting sanctions. Uh, this is uh, not a policy uh, to be purely pun punitive. This is a policy to change behavior. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a policy to deter a further Russian invasion of Ukraine, to deter a war, a bloody, costly, uh, devastating war uh, that would take place on European soil and that would constitute uh, the greatest threat uh, to uh, peace and security since the conclusion of World War II, certainly since uh, the end of the Cold War. Right, but now the imposition of sanctions is a deterrent? I thought we just spent the last like couple of months, you and the administration spent like the last couple of months arguing that 
the threat of sanctions was the deterrent, and that if you impose the, that if you actually impose them, then you would lose that deterrent. Matt, you've you've heard us say. Uh, well, you we, can't have it both ways. We, we're not having it both ways, Matt. Uh, you have heard us say very clearly: if Russia's uh, invasion escalates, if Russia's actions escalate, so too uh, will our response. Uh, we are prepared uh, to enact uh, an escalating series of measures against the Russian Federation, uh, if unless uh, until and unless that the Russian Federation uh, changes course. So, I, uh, so look, I, I don't have any response to that, but a uh, specific response to that, but I will make the point that uh, this has not been Lynn lease This has been a program of provision. We have provided uh, our Ukrainian partners with, over the course of the last year, $650 million uh, worth of defensive uh, security assistance. Uh, we're in a constant uh, conversation and dialogue with our Ukrainian partners about their uh, defensive security needs, uh, and that will continue. As I mentioned before, uh, if the uh, Russian invasion uh, continues, we will not only continue with that provision um, of, uh, of security assistance, but we'll double down on it. So yeah. Could I change topic? Anything yeah, left on Russia, Ukraine? On the Palestinian. Uh, in, the, in the very back, please. Yes, sir. So, but you, we listen to the Russians also, and they present also, as they say, their legit uh, security grievances. And it seems the West, in a way or another, did not reach uh, any uh, any lie, any common, to, to which extent the U.S. and NATO now is is really going into this offer of diplomacy? Where is the West going to give in, in into the security demands from Putin? So this is something we've uh, spoken to at, at great length. It's actually something that we put in writing at, at some length. Uh, subscribers of uh, El Pais can uh, see it with their own eyes. Uh, but we've been uh, quite clear that there are some quote unquote demands. Uh, that the Russian Federation has put forward that uh, are non-starters for us. Uh, the very principles that are at stake in terms of the rules-based international order, those are not negotiable. Uh, the idea uh, that uh, any other country can dictate uh, the policy choices, whether foreign policy or domestic policy of any other country, that is not something we're going to negotiate. International borders, internationally recognized borders, sovereignty, the inviolability uh, of borders, uh, that is not something that is up for negotiation. Uh, but what we there are some areas that would uh, improve our security, um, uh, our own uh, security environment, uh, the security environment of the transatlantic community, and could address some of the stated security concerns of the Russian Federation. And we've delineated a series of those uh, discussions uh, regarding the placement of offensive uh, missiles. Uh, in Europe, broader arms control uh, protocols, uh, protocols regarding uh, stability and transparency, uh, uh, confidence building measures. There are a number of areas that we think have the potential uh, to be fruitful if we find um, a negotiating counterpart in the Russian Federation that operates in good faith. Uh, we have not found that yet. Uh, and I think at this stage, uh, those sort of broader areas uh, may not take precedence to uh, the first priority that we have, and that's averting a bloody, costly, devastating uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, so I think our diplomacy going forward, uh, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, if, again, we find uh, a counterpart uh, in Moscow that is willing to sit down uh, in good faith to discuss these issues uh, in good faith, uh, we are going to be very focused on saving lives, on preventing a war, uh, on seeing to it that uh, the plans Putin has set in motion over the course of uh, many months now uh, do not go forward. Connor. Just very quickly, on um, Trevor Weed and Paul Whelan, is there any indication that their cases are being treated separately from all this? Um, any concerns that, that the crisis would affect uh, their detentions? Uh, we always treat the cases of U.S. hostages uh, separate and apart from uh, geopolitical uh, issues and geopolitical dynamics. Uh, it remains an absolute priority for us uh, to see the release of Paul Whelan uh, and Trevor Reed, both of whom have been held uh, unjustly, traveled to Russia as tourists, uh, have been in imprisoned on uh, false charges uh, that entire time. So it's a priority of ours. You do, but, the, but do you have any concern that the Russian government would not? Uh, again, it, human beings should not be held as pawns uh, in, in terms of 
state-to-state uh, -state relations. Uh, it is our priority uh, to see them released, uh, to do everything we can uh, to achieve their release uh, as quickly as we can. And then secondly, do you have any uh, new estimate of the number of Americans that would be in Ukraine at this moment in time? So as we've uh, told you, uh, late last year, October of last year, uh, it was our assessment at the time that there were some 6,600 Americans who were resident uh, in Ukraine. Now, that time frame is important because uh, the very month, October 2021, that this assessment was uh, last updated was the very month that we started urging Americans not to travel to Ukraine. Uh, in more recent weeks, as you know, uh, we have been recommending and um, even more recently urging uh, Americans to leave Ukraine. So uh, I think there is every expectation that the number of Americans who were resident in Ukraine uh, late last year, October of last year, uh, is far lower now uh, than it was uh, then. I can tell you procedurally, uh, we have been uh, in repeated uh, contact with uh, Americans who uh, remain in Ukraine. We have uh, asked them uh, to provide us with their contact information so that we can continue to be in communication with them, uh, to urge them uh, to leave the country, uh, to avail themselves uh, of commercial and private options that continue uh, to be available and to provide any form of support that they may need in doing so. And that includes a repatriation loan uh, if they're not able to uh, afford uh, the return travel uh, on their own. When it, in addition, we have uh, provided specific guidance on overland crossings uh, that Americans can take, providing uh, specific recommendations about border crossings. We have been engaged in diplomacy with our Polish allies uh, to see to it that uh, Americans need not have um, any sort of advanced authorization uh, to travel across the border. We've even established a welcome center uh, across uh, the Polish border to assist Americans uh, should they need uh, any um, uh, any assistance, whether it's a passport application, whether it's any form, other form of uh, consular assistance. So uh, yes. Uh, they're Americans who are unjustly detained. They are they are they are Americans who are uh, who are held uh, unjustly against I, their will. I know, but do you regard them as hostages? I I we'll get back to you if there's a uh, if if uh, on that. Yes. Latin America, the fact that Putin is looking for new partners uh, in Latin America, for example, Argentina, Brazil. What's the position of uh, the State Department? And do you think this is a way to increase the pressure on the United States? They're talking about the close relationship of United States with Latin America. Well, it goes back to what we were discussing uh, before. Uh, and this is the fact that what we are seeing is um, autocracies around the world uh, band together. Uh, and we've seen, uh, in some ways, Russia at uh, the vanguard of this activity. When it comes to their motives or intentions, uh, that's not something I would, uh, I would want to speak to from here. Uh, I would refer you to, the, to Moscow um, to speak to uh, their own foreign policy decisions. Uh, but uh, we have certainly seen uh, Moscow um, reach out to some of the most repressive, autocratic, undemocratic uh, governments in this hemisphere. That includes uh, Nicaragua. Uh, that includes Cuba. Uh, that includes Venezuela. Yes, Saeed. Uh, I want to move to the Palestinian issue, and I have a quick one on Iran. On the Palestinian issue, yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, on the Palestinian issue, I know I have asked in this room many times before on your position regarding the practice of administrative detention by Israel, to which all Palestinians at one time or another probably experienced. But there is one particular case, a 14-year-old boy, who has been falsely accused. One Israeli judge after Israeli judge threw it out of court, but the authorities keep him in prison. They keep renewing this. He has a neuromuscular disease. He might die in prison. Will the United States call on Israel to quit, uh, to quit this practice, especially against children who have, not, who have been found innocent by their own judicial system? Said, you've heard this from us uh, before, but and we the urge. The name, by the way, is just for the record, Amal Nathlet. We urge the full respect for human rights in Israel uh, and the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, as we said many times, uh, Palestinians and Israelis alike uh, equally deserve uh, to live safely and securely, to enjoy equal measures uh, of freedom, of security, of prosperity. Do 
not a red Israeli and put them under administration. Said, we, we, and again, you've heard this from us before, but we continue to elevate the role of, of human rights in our foreign relations and to encourage, uh, to your question, legal reforms uh, that advance respect for human rights of all individuals. My second question also uh, pertains to the holding of dead Palestinians, killed Palestinians, those who have been killed by the Israeli authorities for years on end. Is that a, is that a form of collective punishment? Does it? Does the this administration view, view this as a collective punishment? Uh, we have stressed to Israel, uh, both publicly uh, as well as privately, uh, our strong hope that any measures that Israel take, uh, takes would be designed to avoid uh, further escalating tensions uh, and to take into consideration uh, the impact of any such me measures on the Palestinian people. And lastly, on Iran, uh, should we expect uh, some sort of a a deal or returning to a deal over the next few days, as it was suggested? Well, uh, you've heard this uh, from my colleagues, but uh, there has been significant progress, uh, and we are uh, close uh, to a possible deal. But uh, at the same time, a number of very difficult issues uh, remain unresolved. Uh, what we know is that uh, there is very little time uh, remaining to reach a deal to resolve uh, these uh, remaining issues, uh, given the pace of Iran's nuclear advances. Uh, you've heard us say this before, but it remains true uh, that even as uh, we are narrowing uh, the set of issues we're discussing, uh, nothing is agreed until uh, everything is agreed. Uh, if Iran shows seriousness, if it demonstrates uh, serious a purpose uh, in Vienna, we believe that we can and should uh, reach an understanding on a, a potential mutual return to compliance uh, in short order, potentially within dates. Um, but anything uh, much beyond that, if this were to drag on any longer than that, uh, would put the possibility of return to the deal uh, at uh, grave and profound risk. Andrew. Mm -hmm. Any more specifics in Palestine regarding the issues, whether they involve, you know, equipment, centrifuges, uh, compliance, verification, broad categories, Ned? Uh, I really can't, uh, and that is primarily because we are at this decisive stage uh, where it is incumbent on uh, the Iranians and, and all parties uh, to um, uh, do everything we can to narrow those differences. Uh, we're going to be a little bit more circumspect uh, at this especially sensitive period. Uh, but again, if, if the Iranians demonstrate seriousness of purpose, uh, we believe that we can achieve an understanding in relatively short order. Is there anything more on travel? On travel. By the Secretary. Oh, by the Secretary. Uh, we, look, we do not have uh, any travel to uh, announce or to preview uh, at this time. The Secretary has been working uh, the phones. He's uh, been on with um, Joseph Burrell uh, of the EU today. He spoke to uh, his British counterpart, Elizabeth Truss, uh, earlier today uh, as well. Uh, and I expect you will see him continue to engage with uh, his, uh, his counterparts around the world. Yes. Uh, we saw the designations today, mm -hmm. and in the statement, you said they are intensifying the humanitarian crisis. When you removed them last year from the uh, terrorist organization list, you said uh, you did that for humanitarian purposes. Uh, is the State Department, my first question, is the State Department objecting uh, designating them as a terrorist organization? So as you know, there's a, a review underway uh, regarding um, that very question, so I'm not in a position to uh, speak to it in any great detail. Um, what I can say is that uh, we have a number of tools at our disposal, including the tools we uh, use today uh, in mounting sanctions and designations uh, against these uh, Houthi-affiliated individuals and entities uh, that can uh, hold the Houthis accountable for uh, their reprehensible behavior. Uh, we are uh, committed to doing so. We will continue uh, to do so. Uh, we will use every appropriate tool uh, to, ho to hold accountable uh, those Houthi leaders who are responsible for uh, the terrorist attacks uh, for, uh, against our uh, partners uh, in the region, uh, for the violence in Yemen itself, uh, for the humanitarian emergency. Uh, which by uh, many estimations is uh, now the world's worst humanitarian catastrophe with some 16 million people uh, who are suffering from uh, food insecurity uh, and malnutrition. Uh, so we are committed uh, to doing everything we can to bring this conflict to an end 
uh, knowing that only through a diplomatic resolution will we be able to, uh, on a sustainable basis, um, calm the violence, uh, ease the humanitarian suffering uh, of the Yemeni people, and mitigate uh, the threat that um, the United States uh, and our partners uh, face from the Houthis, including in the, uh, in the, in the context of uh, these, these attacks. Iran, do we expect anything regarding the detainees ahead of the deal? Uh, again, this is an issue that is of the utmost uh, importance to the United States at every single opportunity. Uh, we uh, uh, make the release uh, of Americans, of other third country nationals, uh, a priority of ours. Uh, we have been clear that uh, the nuclear negotiations in Vienna uh, and our efforts to see our uh, unjustly detained citizens released, these operate on separate tracks precisely because uh, a potential return to the JCPOA has always at best uh, been an uncertain proposition and we want the release of our citizens uh, to be a certain proposition. Uh, so we have not explicitly tied uh, our Americans, tied uh, these individuals, these detainees uh, to progress in the nuclear talks. but. Uh, as uh, Rob Malley has made clear, uh, it is um, certainly, it colors uh, our engagement um, in Vienna and elsewhere, um, knowing that uh, this is a government that is unjustly detaining uh, Americans and other uh, third country nationals. So uh, in every other context, we're doing this, but certainly in the case uh, of Iran, we're making every effort uh, to see our Americans, to see other third country nationals uh, released just as quickly as possible. Uh, and I realize that a lot of people probably think this is just a semantic thing, so I'll keep it short. But uh, the, these designations were made under a, an, uh, an executive order that is a counterterrorism executive order. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, in, in the Secretary's statement and the Treasury statement, it refers to the Houthis committing terrorist acts. But it doesn't identify them as terrorists. Uh, and the EO, the, they're, they're being used, they're being designated under a counterterrorism EO simply because of their affiliation with the IRGC Quds Force, which is a designated foreign terrorist organization. So my question is, do you believe that the Houthis, are, as, a, as a group, are terrorists? You say that they, you've designated them under a counterterrorism executive order. You s accuse them of staging, launching terrorist attacks, but you won't call them terrorists. Uh, Matt, Why not? So this is a question that's based on semantics, but we've been very clear well, uh, that we that will. that the Houthis have launched reprehensible terrorist attacks yes. uh, against our partners in the region. Uh, these may be attacks that are uh, targeting our partners, but uh, these types of uh, operations have the potential not only to harm. Uh, citizens of Saudi Arabia, citizens of the United yes. Arab Emirates, but Americans uh, yes. who may be in the region as well. So we uh, have been very clear uh, that these are terrorist attacks. Yeah, but you're not saying that the Houthis themselves are terrorists, and I'm just wondering why. And yes, it's a semantic argument, but you know, I'm just looking at a statement that came out from Senator Murphy and a bunch of his colleagues urging you not to, re, uh, to reinstate the foreign terrorist organization designation against the Houthis, so uh, because it would cause grave damage and economic, the humanitarian, even worse humanitarian disaster. But yet today you have designated these individuals and entities under a counterterrorism executive order and accused them of committing terrorist attacks. Uh, so what what's the problem? Why can't you it identify is, it the It is completely as consistent uh, that a certain label and a certain authority, in this case the FTO, uh, not be applied to a group that can commit terrorist attacks. There are any number of examples. The groups that aren't FTOs uh, that you know well that have committed over the course of years consistent terrorist attacks. Uh, this is a question of uh, uh, so semantics. Right. This is a question of well, legal it's a authorities. Of political will, right? Or, it, or, it, or is, it is. It is. Uh, it is a question uh, of us demonstrating that we have a number of tools and a number of authorities uh, to hold 
Houthi leaders and others affiliated with uh, this movement accountable uh, for their reprehensible actions, okay. including the terrorist attacks that they've undertaken in recent days against our partners in the okay. region. Can you give me an example of a group that has been committing terrorist attacks for decades that has not been labeled an FTO? Uh, Matt, I think there are a number of examples. You could uh, uh, look at the Taliban uh, as a group that is not an FTO that I think you would probably agree has committed terrorist attacks. Thank you all very much.